Good evening again, everyone. So I think we are at a place where we can start. Welcome to part two of the Financial Literacy and Wellness webinar. Our presenters tonight will be Stacia Morris and Kevin Hope. And I'm sure they have a great presentation lined up for us. So I'm, we're raring to go and I'm excited. All right, so before we start, I just want to confirm that we're all hearing. So if you could just type in the chat, use your reactions, thumbs up, smiley faces, just that we know that you know, you're hearing clearly and ready to get going. All right, I'm seeing some comments in the chat, so we're good to go. All right, so I'm Karina Dice, the Campus Alumni Officer for the Mona Campus, and I'll be moderating tonight. As I mentioned, this is part two of the Financial Literacy and Wellness webinar. And this will be done from a Caribbean perspective. So before we go on, I just want to just lay some ground rules. Be reminded that is a, this is a voice activated call. Therefore, your mics have been muted and will remain muted until the Q&A session. Additionally, our presenters gave us permission to record a session. So the audience, you, might appear in the recorded sessions, which can be used for training purposes, promotion, and will be archived by our YouTube channel. Now, with that said, and the excitement that is building for this great webinar, I will turn over to Stacia and Kevin to introduce themselves. Okay, thank you very much, Karina. I must say, I just love being on your platform. Uh, thank you. This is like my fourth time on your platform. Um, Kevin and I are going to really give you, we're going to present you with three eyes tonight. We're going to present you with an interesting and impactful and an information loaded session. We are very enthused to do this. Um, the last time I was on, I, we had lots of questions and I just thought it would be good. A lot of questions came from the Caribbean and I couldn't answer it because I live in the US and I know the US and I, I don't talk, I don't go out of my lane. I, don't, I used to be an athlete, run in your lane. I don't go out of my lane. So I invited Kevin. Um, Kevin is a fellow of Incension, and Kevin is also a really good friend of my brother Desmond's. That's how I met Kevin. And therefore, let me go into introducing Kevin. Then Kevin, most people hopefully would have seen me if you had been on before. I'm talking really fast because we have a lot of stuff to offer you tonight. So here goes introducing Kevin, fellow of Incension. Kevin has over 15 years of policy and project-oriented experience working with Caribbean institutions, and he's an economist. He holds the MSc degree, Financial and Business, and a BSc Economics from the University of the West Indies. And he is an economics PhD candidate with Bournemouth University in the UK. Kevin's passion is for economic development and public policy. He has an ability to turn economic concepts into practical, investable ideas. Kevin is currently employed as an economist at the Cent Caribbean Development Bank, having previously worked at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank as an economist and debt management specialist. Kevin is ILO certified. He has done a lot of training. He also lectures at the University of the West Indies Cape, Cape Hill campus in trade policy, economics, leadership, and entrepreneurship. Kevin has provided training and technical assistance to several micro, small, and medium entrepreneur enterprises and organizations within the Caribbean community. And I wanted to throw it out to the audience that if you're an entrepreneur, you want some ideas, get Kevin's information at the end of the evening. You can get mine also, Caribbean stuff, get Kevin's. So um, introducing Kevin, welcome Kevin. And Kevin would now introduce me not much don't say much kevin i hope most people have seen me know me so over to you kevin okay well i want to say a resounding thank you stacy stacia for the opportunity to share this platform with you tonight and also for the audience stacy is my mentor my sister and she's an author of teen money 101 and teen money 102. she's also a founder of your life trek which focuses on catalyzing and improving the lives of women and families worldwide with a focus on financial literacy, financial health and wellness, and professional leadership coaching. Stacia holds a post MBA certificate in accounting and an MBA from Pace University, New York, a BA from the University of the West Indies and multiple certification. And she currently works as a financial advisor. 
Stacio's passion uh, traveling, speaking, and teaching, as you can see, the, as the passion is already evident tonight. And this thread has run throughout her entire life, the daughter of, of, of a teacher. She also go about encouraging um, and empowering a lot of persons, including myself, and deliver a series of workshops on financial literacy and wellness to multiple organizations and multiple ethnic groups. Stacia has used her exceptional experience in, in reinventing herself and currently is providing impactful leadership coaching, um, a methodology that she developed called APEX, a personal professional experience, a popular international keynote and feature speaker, and has appeared on numerous, on numerous TV and radio, and, very, and her book, Teen Money 101, has been featured on ABC, news and more recently have she has she had digitalized her books and courses via her website your money live track so you have the floor stacy okay let's go kevin let's um just let's just go share a lot of information with everybody here so i'm going to share my screen and i'm going to walk you through what we're going to be doing today can everybody see my screen I think so. Okay, let's go to, let's do a slide, slideshow here. Okay, so tonight Kevin and I have the floor and then I'm going to show you when you have the floor and hope you come up with some lots of questions. So you just got to know Kevin and myself. This is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about, I'm going to give you an overview, a brief overview of what we had discussed in part one of, of this, um, this seminar. We're going to talk about this financial literacy versus financial wellness and the CEO overview. And then you're going to get some really informational and impactful information from Kevin about the Caribbean economic perspective. Then we're going to do a Q&A between Kevin and myself. What I thought we'd do the questions that were left over from part one that I couldn't answer because I was not in my lane to answer Caribbean wide questions. I'm going to pose those questions to Kevin and he's going to provide us with answers. And then we'll hopefully we'd have some time. I'm talking really fast. When I'm hyped, I talk really fast. We're going to have some time for you, the, the audience, to ask questions. So here goes. Previously, I talked about financial literacy versus financial wellness did some work on wellness. Then I talked about being the CEO of your household. To be the CEO of your household, you have to know and manage your income and expense, manage your credit, manage your balance sheet, manage your do budget and planning. And then la the last time I talked about my personal experience, I, I talk about myself. Usually, I know I have some siblings in the audience listening, but I usually talk about my siblings. And they can't do anything to me because once it's my experience, it's mine to talk about. So I used to talk about my siblings. And then I gave a call to action. And I want to know tonight, what have you acted on? So financial wellness. We are told, and there was a study done, that there was a link. There is a link between financial literacy and financial wellness among African-Americans. Those who are more financially literate are more likely to plan and save for retirement and to have non-retirement savings and also to better manage their debts and to be less likely fragile, financially fragile. And if we pause and talk about financially fragile or financial fragility, we realize that we have gone through about 15 months of a pandemic. We are told that we should have between three to six months of emergency savings. Nobody, most people, did not plan for 15 months and more of emergency savings. And particularly as African-Americans, we need to, and Afro-Caribbean, Afro, we as people generally, we need to be financially well and save for emergencies. We need to be financially well at all stages of our lives. And in the last webinar, we talked about what a college student needs. What does a young adult need? A young adult who has, is married and has kids, those people climbing the corporate ladder, entrepreneurs, 
mid-career people, pre-retiree people, pre-retirees. We talked about people who were the sandwich generation. You had kids that you had to take care of and you had parents you had to take care of. How do we plan for all these stages of, of our lives? Then I went into what's financial illiteracy. And I told everybody on the call the last time, and I'll say it again, I, as Kevin read my bio, I'm fully educated. Um, some siblings would say I'm probably a nerd because I still attend all these webinars and seminars, et cetera. But I had poor money management until something happened to me. And what happened to me was I got downsized from IBM and I had to wake up really quickly. So, this is what the UN says about financial wellness and financial literacy. The UN says that financial literacy is a key pillar. It's critical for, su finance, for success for nine of their 17 sustainable development goals. The UN also says if we eliminate poverty, we will achieve gender uh, and we achieve gender equality. It's not possible until we to achieve these because two thirds of the adults worldwide remain financially illiterate. And women, I talk a lot to women, women there and there to my heart, women, and as I told Kevin today, women includes men and we know that, women continue to trail men in financial decision making. On my next slide, I'm gonna tie the financial illiteracy among women and their decision making in the, within their households. So 70% of women are CEOs of their households, but we heard that two thirds of adults remain financially illiterate and women continue to trail men. So women, we have a challenge. If we're gonna be 70% of us are gonna be CEOs of our household, of our household finances, we need to get our act together in understanding and being financially literate and not only financially literate, but be financially well. And here is where I draw the distinction. And as I went along, hopefully you got it. There's a dire need for financial literacy, which means to know. Also, there's a dire need for financial wellness. We take the knowledge and we apply it to our personal situations. So as CEO of your household, you'd manage your household. You would understand, as I said, your income, what comes in, what goes out. We know a lot of what comes in, but very little, not many of us track what goes out, or especially when what goes out goes to credit cards and credit spending. We need to understand our cash flow, our savings, our balance sheet, here's where we talk about wealth, a lot of us are not wealthy. We don't have anything to pass on to our next generation. We don't have any legacy to pass on because we have not kept value. We have not kept net assets. We have spent, let's put it that way. We also need to manage our credit and do budget and planning. And if you want to listen to this, probably you can send Karina a note and you can hear the part one that we did on this. Okay. So, this is scary. This is talking about wealth. What do we, what's our legacy? What do we pass on? The black white wealth gap reflects our society. I want you to look at what's highlighted. The average white family has $171,000 of net worth. That means their assets minus their liabilities, they're left with a net worth of $171,000. But the black family only has $17,000. So the average white family has 10 times the wealth that a black family has. I know this reflects mostly the US, but let, let's, let's um, look at this worldwide. And when Kevin talks, he'll talk to you about what, what the Caribbean looks like in terms of poverty. So to review, Let's just go to the end of this and say, be the CEO of your household. And when Kevin talks and pass it back to me, I will tell you how we go about helping you to be the CEO of your household. 
immediate call to action. I had asked you to con control your financial wellness. I had asked you to be intentional, to manage, 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 build a budget. And a lot of what I said around the budget was if you had a budget, and your siblings or your children or grandchildren or anybody come and say, well, I need some money, I need some money to borrow. You can look at your budget and then blame your budget. So remember that when you can't help people or you don't want to help them because you need to help yourself first, just blame the budget. Tell them your budget doesn't allow you to lend them. The other thing is to manage your cash flow, what comes in, what goes out, use as little credit as possible. Save. We needed 15 plus months of emergency funding. And I thought generally for all of us, for me, that was that did not exist. Manage your credit, get your credit report. And please, I know it's tough, it's hard to do, but have family conversations. That's something we miss in our in our culture. Uh, Kevin mentioned that I my dad was a headmaster in the Caribbean, and you know, I thought I knew, and he taught us what he knew. We never had financial family conversations. And you need to have that so that your kids are not scared. They know what to ask for. They understand when they can't get the latest iPad, iPhone, etc. So if you do nothing, hopefully you've taken some action since we last talked, spoke, maybe a, a month or so. Have family conversations. And on that note, Kevin, I pass over to you. Thank you, Stacia. If you can uh, turn to the next slide for me, please. Okay. So colleagues, since December, 2019, the COVID-19 coronavirus outbreak has been spreading rapidly across the world. Declared a global pandemic on May 11, 2020 by the World Health Organization, the outbreak has resulted in an estimated 147.5 million confirmed cases, as you see in the top right of the slide, and approximately 3.2 million deaths in 185 countries as at April 26, 2021. At the global level, COVID has morphed into a health, human, and economic crisis without precedent within the last century, and one that is continually evolving. Economies have shut down and are paralyzed, and societies are in quarantine to varying degrees, measures that are only comparable to those in war situations. Next slide, please. At the regional level, the COVID-19 pandemic presents a severe shock to a number of our tourism-dependent countries, in addition to our commodity-dependent island states. This disruption in international trade and travel, local containment measures, as well as the global recession have dramatically halted the tourism sector and adversely affected domestic production, as business activity has been reduced in an effort to contain the spread of the disease. From a regional level, the Caribbean response and management of the pandemic vary, is very well, varied and is reflected in the number of infections and deaths, as you see on the slide. On average, the initial rapid response to COVID-19 limited the number of infections and deaths. However, efforts at reopening the economy and balancing the health risk resulted in a second wave and community transmission in several countries. So in the two subsequent slides, you would see a sort of illustration of how, how the COVID would have evolved in a number of our island states. So in a number of island states, and this epidemiological curve for country, per country is tracking from the period March 2020 to April 2021. So at least you get an idea as to how countries trended along their epidemiological curve. Next slide, please. And you would see for a number of countries, at least some evidence as what we would say was a first and second wave. And in some instances, a number of countries may even be going through almost potentially a third wave due to the large community spread across country. Next slide, please. So of the Caribbean countries that began vaccinated, 
15 of, these, of those countries have received vaccination through the COVAX facility. Some anecdotal information, um, for example, as at April 26, 2021, Antigua and Barbuda total vaccine doses per 100 persons is approximately 30.6. This is compared to Israel, which is known internationally as we scan the media to be one of the countries that has done a tremendous job with vaccination. Um, so compared to Israel, 120 doses per 100 persons, or the UK or the US, the UK 69 doses per 100 persons, and the US 69 doses per 100 person. So on one hand, looking into the short term, well, in the medium term, if we're thinking about the second half of 2021, and given that a number of our tourism dependent islands depend on tourists from the US, the UK and Europe, if this vaccination level continues and trend towards Israel, then one could anticipate at least a modest recovery in tourism, hopefully in the second half of the year to the last quarter of the year. Suffice to say that expanded vaccination will definitely ensure that our people and economies can begin to rebuild and recover. However, given the limited supplies, even under the COVAX system, vaccination alone would not end the pandemic. And as a consequence, we need to adhere to the public health measures such as washing hands, wearing masks and maintaining social distance to at least reduce deaths and protect our fragile health systems. In terms of the economic impact, so what you see in the top half of this slide is what one may consider to be the transmission channels via which COVID has been impacted a number of our territories. Um, suffice to say, tourism is again one of our major sectors within the region, which accounts for at least two thirds of our gross domestic product and at least 40% of our export earnings. Not to mention it's predominantly one of the major employer in terms of sectors after government and agriculture in a number of countries, but tourism is the leading sector in a number of our countries. And as a consequence, any negative shock to tourism, given both its direct and indirect relationship with other sectors would and can result in, in what we would say a multiply effect in terms of job loss, in terms of revenue loss for government. Similarly, one could appreciate that due to the COVID impact and the, imp and the impact it would have had on trade flows, that a number of our imports and or exports of commodities, manufactured goods and capital goods have declined more or less. And as a consequence, our countries are in dire straits with respect to export earning and equally with respect to resources in terms of government revenue. And government's response so this health crisis also required government to increase their expenditure or reallocate expenditure in terms of health, education and social protection. And as a consequence, a number of our territories have had what we call imbalances in terms of its fiscal operation and huge financing needs as at 2020, 2020 and as a consequence, the need to finance this into 2021. Suffice to say that a number of the short term impact you would see manifest in subsequent slide, but the expectation there is a higher unemployment, according to the data that we have and anecdotal information, we have had increase in poverty and inequality. And one could anticipate if we do not recover, or if we do not have a strong recovery, and there's a protracted recovery more or less, where persons have, are, are experiencing lower wages and income, one could anticipate issues surrounding potential bankruptcies and even a downturn in private investment. Next slide, please. So what you see here is an appreciation of the last five years pre-COVID and the projected five years post-COVID according to the IMF World Economic Outlook database as of 20, April 2021. Suffice to say, on average, economic growth in the Caribbean in the period 2015 to 2019 averaged around 2%. And this was consistently lower than the growth rates that other small island developing states and emerging markets would have experienced, where their growth rates were estimated anywhere between 4 and 5.5% during that period. So the impact of the health crisis on economic 
activity and social conditions is expected to be severe within the region. And we have estimates, as you see, by the line, an estimate of the Caribbean real GDP growth rate of anywhere around 13 to 14% negative growth in 2020. And this, as a consequence, can and is leading to a strong setback in, in our gross domestic product or measurement that we use what we call the GDP per capita in terms of gross domestic product per person, right? Per capita, where we divide by the population. And what this is really saying is that we have now regressed at least 10 plus years back to the levels of those experienced in the 2009 global financial crisis. So while one anticipate that there would be a recovery in 2021 and onward, at the moment, there isn't sufficient confidence that we can return to pre-pandemic level of economic development anytime in, in terms of the immediate future. And what this has resulted in is this high, this fall off, this negative growth shock has also resulted in increasing fiscal pressures and also mounting public debts, which as you would know, saw the hamper the delivery of essential services and social transfers to the most needy. And you see on the right, at least the accumulation in public debt. So except for Guyana in 2020, a number of our Caribbean countries have increased their debt indebtedness as a response or as a result of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So suffice to say that the impact of the COVID-19 shock has placed tremendous stress on our social protection system within countries, which prior to COVID were already challenged. And, and obviously that need to respond to the needs of the poor and vulnerable. So you have on the left um, estimates of the high rates of poverty and on the right also um, evidence of the inequality within our number of our Caribbean countries. Suffice to say, poverty and inequality remain a present development challenge. And this pandemic shock has more or less worsened the experiences for a number of the poor and vulnerable in a number of our countries. So the decline in GDP growth obviously reduced employment and increased poverty. And that the social dislocation requires even a much greater um, effort by all stakeholder groups so that we could ensure that we could bounce back better and that we can at least have a recovery that's sustained and can generate the type of jobs that would engender and support at least reducing poverty, reducing inequality and by extension, reducing the high or the doubling of the unemployment rate that you saw in the previous slide. Next slide, please. This is um, taken from a study by the IMF and this is instructive. What they sought to do is to compare the characteristics um, that, that really governs medium term growth and prosperity by comparing the Caribbean, and the Caribbean is the two columns to the furthest left of this slide. So you have the tourist dependent and the commodity dependent Caribbean countries, the two columns to the furthest left, relative to other emerging, mar emerging markets and developing country groups. And for each of these indicators, the color of each cell indicate the relative ranking of that country group compared to the other. So the red, if we think of a traffic light, indicates a less favorable ranking, and the green indicates a more favorable ranking. I wouldn't go through all 20, but suffice to say, they're, they're very interesting insights that one could glean from this. Again, the high debt, which one would understand if a, if a country is carrying high debt levels, this reduced the debt servicing, alone would reduce money that could be otherwise spent in health and education or even in social protection. A number of our countries are extremely vulnerable to natural disasters. Um, we know of the shock of Dorian. We know of Hurricane Orma and Maria in 2017. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they are currently facing the, a volcanic shock. And what we've seen based on data from since 2000 to present is that the annual damage associated with natural disasters is anywhere around 2.3% of our gross domestic product and could be as low as 1.3% of the gross domestic product in our commodity exporting countries. Suffice to say that we also have to budget for responding to natural disasters. We are pretty much aware of the brain drain or the continued brain drain 
and obviously the skilled um, immigration out emigration out of our countries. And again, a number of those persons who migrate are usually our nationals with tertiary education, which again speaks to again the importance of or the impairment of our, of our country's stock of skills and knowledge, which we tend to call in, in economic development human capital. Next slide, please. Thank you. And I should comment on that brain drain question. Um, usually 100% of my family have brain drained out to St. Vincent. Yes. Seven yes. of us. Okay, Kevin. And, and while there are counter arguments and fair ones with respect to the level of remittances, and I know we are continuing to try to make our impact in the country of origin, it's, it's, it's a delicate balance. And I think examples of India, equally examples of the Chinese where they're trying to attract their nationals overseas to invest. I'm fully aware of Jamaica, um, strong diaspora initiatives where they have annual events so that they can extend to the diaspora to come and reinvest or to invest in building Jamaica. And those are initiatives that I strongly support. Um, so, if we were to zoom in, in terms of the Caribbean, and I sort of give you where we are at, some ideas as to some projections into the future, and now we're zooming into the household or into, the, you know, as to the economic agent, each, each person, each, you know, every one of us. So what COVID-19 pandemic has done is expose our fragility in terms of individuals and the household. So there are estimates that anywhere of around six out of 10 persons actually lack the resources to cover an emergency. And for those who are among our poorest quintile, this would be probably every, about two out of every 10 actually have the resources to cover an emergency. So even on top of the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, COVID clearly illustrate the need and urgency for us to increase financial resilience, right? Um, it underscored the importance of financial literacy in terms of helping families to plan, save and invest in a way that we could become more resilient in the future as, because one could anticipate future exogenous shocks, whether it be pandemics, we've been following the media a lot to know that there are other types of illnesses that could you know, that could evolve, um, whether it's climatic shocks, as for example, the displacement of close to 20,000 persons on the northern side of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So again, we have to see financial literacy as part of us building that resilience within our households and that we can cope and survive through shock. What you have here depicted, I just pulled two graphic just to illustrate um, the results of two financial literacy survey that was done, that were done, one in Jamaica, I, I think around 2012, 2013, and more recently in 2020 in Barbados. But permit me just to quote and share with you some insights. So on the illustration on the left, it's estimated that only about 33% of Jamaicans surveyed actually had the knowledge of basic financial principles. And this was much lower than a number of the countries such as the Denmark, the Norway, and the Sweden, which ranked around 71% of the adults were financially literate. Of interest, a 2012 UE Mona study found that both education and income are positively associated with our overall financial scores, specific to the survey that was done in Jamaica. And this sort of corroborates what you're seeing on your right in that a telephone survey that was done in May to June 2020 by the Inter-American Development Bank, where they sought to measure financial literacy in Barbados, they also found that financial literacy levels increase with education. Of interest, and this is to corroborate something that um, Stacia said earlier, this, their survey found that men tend to score higher on financial literacy index. Also, that financial literacy is correlated to greater ability to withstand shocks or hardship. So for example, they found that among the respondents who lost their jobs during the pandemic, those who still met their basic needs on average actually scored higher on the financial literacy index than those who could not have met their basic needs. And even for those who did not lose income, 
there was a positive link between financial literacy and the ability to, to cope and to endure. They also found that the more financially literate you were, the greater the likelihood that you were using more complex payment systems, the ability to use mobile and on online payments, as we've seen evidence of this, a lot of this during the, pan during the pandemic where we were at least had to quarantine at home. And as a result, could have continued business. We could have even continued um, facilitating our children with their education or even facilitate remittance payments or flows to and from business to business or individual to individual. Of interest, I would quote a 2013 OECD study on Latin America and the Caribbean that highlighted that more than 50% of the population within the region generally do not save for retirement. There are lower income citizens. Well, sorry, we generally do not save for retirement. Um, we, or it, we hardly invest in stocks. And more so, you would find a higher level of financial literacy among the high income and the young persons with higher level of education. So this is just corroborating what I said to give you the broad idea as to where we stand. So at least 50% of our, of our population in the Caribbean are actually not practicing prudent and proper financial management. So it's important to note therefore that part of the call to action is where we, where we need to at least look at the opportunities to continue to attend seminars, webinars, pod, listen to podcasts, you know, subscribe to financial blogs. I just put a few of some of the um, broker, broker um, dealers and, and some key resource that you can get financial information in the region. It's important to have peer groups where you can have this type of discussion and even start to try to introduce, you know, the knowledge around financial wellness within your household. Just to reiterate the importance of building up that knowledge so that we could apply it to Winston to withstand, to withstand shocks into the near future, colleagues. And permit me just to share with you two more slides. Okay. Um, and since um, we just talked about resources, I just want to flash up my resource on there that we've been doing this for about 12 years or so, ever since I wrote the book on Team Money 101 and everything is online and you'd get all my information soon. Okay. So here's the other slide, Kevin. Thank you, Stacia. And thank you for thank you for sharing with the audience the use you know how much information there is that we can also facilitate with. So this is interesting. So the World Economic Forum um, produced a future a future jobs report, I think, annually. So it's, I would strongly recommend um, to all my counterparts on the call to have a look at that. Have a look at that um, report. It's instructive, and this sort of gives you an idea as to what are some of the emerging jobs and also what are some of the declining jobs in terms of the landscape into the short to medium term. So of interest, there are growing occupations such as data analysts, so, um, software development, social media specialists, you name it, because we are now utilizing more technology. And of importance, there's still a demand for jobs surrounding the use of human traits. So customer service, sales and marketing, training and development, people and culture, um, organizational development, all these are still in demand, great demand. Um, of interest, given what we've experienced in 2020, there is now a greater reliance on automation and digitalization. And as a consequence, we also need to be mindful and anticipate where our industry, our sectors are trending so that we could try to position ourselves so that we're not left behind. And what's important is that an expectation that we're in the past, on average, 71% of the total task hours um, was covered by human output. The expectation is that only in the future, only about 58 or let's say 45% of those task hours would be performed by human, whereas the rest would be, before, be performed by machines and, and algorithms. And that's important to note, which takes me to the next slide. So part of the challenge that um, Stacy and I actually would pose to you is 
Most of us may be going to a nine to five, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. But the challenge really is, what are you doing or what are we doing? What am I doing from the five to nine, the 5 p.m. to the 9 p.m.? Am I reskilling? Am I working on building my brand? Because as you see here on the right hand side, by 2022, the skills that were required to perform most of the jobs would have shifted significantly. And as a result, we now need to become lifelong learners. We now need to be focused on retraining and upskilling so that we can be ready for 2021 and all of those emerging opportunities in 2022, as most of us will be coming out and going about our business, hopefully freely vaccinated, and now with a rigor, new energy, and ready to take on the world. So on the right-hand side of this chart, I was, ex I was um, a, a close colleague of mine one time. I was helping him with a business plan, and we wanted to get some service to, to get a logo done or some graphics done, a logo design, graphics, what have you. And a close friend of mine mentioned Fiverr as a good platform that one could go and source services. And you would, and of interest, you have to now see yourself as an entrepreneur, each of us as entrepreneurs, because the future is where companies or corporations are now going to seek um, freelancers, persons who could operate and provide services. And we were able to get in quick succession within four hours uh, a logo done by a Pakistani. In a subsequent um, engagement, I was able to get a logo done by, a, by a, a chap from Bangladesh. And of interest, not only were they cost competitive, it was quality work and it was done within a few hours, colleagues. So I strongly recommend for me as an economist by training, I was inquisitive to know who what are some of the services that economists are offering on Fiverr? And as a consequence, I see things like offering to write blogs, um, opportunities to do online tutoring, online coaching. So this is, this is the future in the gig economy where each of us have a skill to, to share. And how do we reskill? How do we upskill that we now not only think of operating within our walls of your respective country, but we could extend services to the wider Caribbean and extend services to the globe. So Kevin, um, why weren't you able to find the resources you needed in the Caribbean instead of having to go to Pakistan? Could you, well, could you find out? It's it actually, the, the capacity exists in country, but it was during the time of COVID. Okay. And it meant that we also within the Caribbean need to find a way in which we could also get our services on platforms so that we could at least extend services within country or across countries. Okay, so at this point, I wanna give a plug for my um, international intern. I have an 18 year old, uh, she should be listening in. I just got her as a, she's my intern and she's been doing research for me. She's from St. Vincent and the Grandines, has been doing research for me and you'd see, I needed a flyer done and I show you the flyer that she did after about three weeks of getting onto this platform. So I'm encouraging people on, 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 on the, the listeners to use your relatives in the Caribbean, wherever, help to train them so that, you know, instead of Kevin having to get help from Pakistan, we can have some local people who we can employ. Back to you, Kevin. Well, I just want to close and then we can have, I mean... The Q&A, we have a Q&A coming up. All right. So I was, I was raised in the church and I think tonight we could think about the parable of the talents. So most of us know the story of the master who entrusted each of his three servants with a sum of money while he was away. And upon his return, he evaluated how well each servant invested his money. Right? So if the servant showed a return on investment, the servant was rewarded with more wealth. The one who made no investment as a result his wealth was stripped away from him. So again, the challenge is, it's critical how, for our quality of life that we're able to read a return on our investment of time, resources, and money. Over to you, Stacia. 
Okay, so I know we're in the interest of time, but some pe people came on kind of a bit late. So uh, Karina, I think we need back our, our 10 minutes or so. I am gonna now pose questions to Kevin and these questions came from part one of this um, seminar when we talked about just everything. And I had questions about credit rating within the Caribbean. So uh, I'm gonna pose the questions and Kevin is gonna answer. So Kevin, um, people want to know, what were credit rating agencies within the Caribbean processes, agencies and processes to rate credit, credit scores, et cetera? So unlike, unlike the United States, um, credit rating bureaus vary across countries. Um, so there are some in country, um, predominantly, I, if I could recall, um, more of the larger and established countries, but Within, let's say, the smaller islands to a large extent, a lot of the credit score rating or risk, assessing credit risk is usually done by financial institutions. So there is definitely a need for us to launch or even to relaunch a number of credit bureau services across countries and potentially have one that could be aggregated such that for most of us now who are trying to do transaction across countries, one could actually be able to take his or her score with them. But I know within the OECS, there have been a lot of push around having a regional credit bureau service, and there have been a number of legislation put in place by the respective central banks to facilitate such. So is this- but it's, evol it's, it's evolving, um, it is evolving. Um, so is, is this an opportunity for an entrepreneur who can do this, set this up? Is this an opportunity? So yes, there is, there, is, there is a lot of scope and um, it's a real opportunity. I think now, even within our territories where there's a push for um, digitalization and even the rollout of digital currencies or even digital payment, that you would find a lot of that data. Um, so a number of countries are also now going pay to pay um, type of lending where a lot of the data that one is capturing from these devices and or services hopefully can also help to engender and support better assessment of risk for applications to be able to access credit. Because ultimately, the reason we, are, we need such credit bureaus is really to be able to access credit within the financial system. Okay. But definitely an opportunity. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna tie the next two questions together. What are the opportunities to invest in the Caribbean and give me some retirement investment options? So I think I need to put out a disclaimer, all right? Okay. So I would strongly encourage anyone who have an interest, interest in investment to consult with their country's brokers, those who are, you know, who treat with equity stocks. It's important for you to definitely seek out financial advisors within your respective um, countries, all right? What I can say, having given that disclaimer, is that even before we think about investment, we need to think of what I would say is our financial oxygen mass, right? So if you're going through turbulence or you're going to be on a plane crash, the first thing you're encouraged is to put on your mask first. So before we could even think about investment, have we done a financial plan for the next three to five years? Have we assessed our own cash flow? Is our expenses greater than our income? Um, what is our debt levels? Is it that I first and foremost need to reduce my credit card payments? Because before you could even jump to investment, because investment is assuming you have speculative income, excess income to invest, or it suggests or assumes you have, you have savings, yeah? But suffice to say, Given the downturn in the economy, something, and this is just a personal exam, you know, personal that I'm sharing, is that I have a genuine interest in real estate, for example. All right. And I'm mindful that our due to high unemployment, a downturn in the economy, limited wages and jobs, one could anticipate that they're probably going to be an increase in non-performing assets. And this is not to say that we're trying to celebrate and profit off of someone's demise, but if you have capital at a time where assets, asset prices would be extremely low, if you have access to capital, now may be an opportune time to contemplate an investment property 
with the hope that when tourism recover, this may be a second home. It could be available for rental units. It may be available for vacation homes, right? So that's an example. Um, within a number of our countries, we do have stock exchanges, but they, in terms of the, the frequency of trades, that varies. I mean, Jamaica has outperformed a number of international stock markets. So Jamaica is a useful case study that one may want to pay attention to and also see if they may have an appetite to even buy some shares in a particular company. We do have a number of mutual funds. We do have a lot of institutional investors. For those who are contemplating medium to long-term goals, let's say for their children education, there are opportunities in terms of, of bonds that one may want to consider buying. But again, consult your financial advisor, speak to some of these financial advisors and equity advisors. And more importantly, first and foremost, come with your financial oxygen mask. So thanks, Kevin, about on that. Um, I didn't throw this out before, but could you at some point, and you can always feed back to us, but I'd like to know what the opportunities are in Guyana, because you showed us Guyana as one of the only positive areas in the Caribbean when you show the chat with everybody has read and Guyana was green. So I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't have to comment on that now, but we can take that up after, okay? I want you to, your name is Kevin Hope and you, you have painted a picture that isn't really hopeful. So I want to give you the opportunity now on the COVID-19 Caribbean outlook. I want you to just give us some hope. So, when we look, when we do outlooks, we look at um, what we would call a baseline case, um, a worst case, and at least a positive scenario. So my task is to be as open and honest as to the risk. And we do have a number of risks on the downside, which may be leaning towards the, the um, worst case from the baseline. But suffice to say, it's projected that on average, the Caribbean is expected to grow around 3% post-pandemic over the next five years, relative to the 2% that I spoke about pre-2020, right? So there, there is optimism around that we should have a sort of U-shape or V-shape recovery once there is an acceleration in vaccination and also a major trade in partners, the US, Europe, the UK, are actually doing well in terms of both their vaccination rollouts and also a return to work. Because the more discretionary income, and I'm, I mean, a lot of us have been looking at the US where um, as a consequence part of government policy, there's been a buildup of, of deposits as households were receiving checks from the government, the US government. And I'm also aware anecdotally that there have been an increase in US travel to the Dominican Republic and or the Bahamas, right? So you find in a number of our tourism dependent countries, there are already projections in terms of forward booking that they anticipate anywhere between a 60% recovery in terms of operation in, in the second half of the year. So one anticipate that once the US, Europe, Canada, and the UK are doing a, a, a tremendous job with vaccination and, 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 and opening up in terms of travel, that let's say somewhere between 20, late 2021 to as early as 2023, and that pent up demand because we've been on lockdown for the last 15 plus months, we all could commute, you know, we're vaccinated and as a consequence be able to utilize some of those vacations that we've built up over the last 15 months. So that's an upside. Okay. An upside also is that while they, we've been set back, COVID presents an opportunity for us now to invest more in terms of health, in terms of education, to actually help reduce the scarring and help improve um, the human capital within the region, right? It also gives us an opportunity, now that while most of us you know, may not have been as exposed or actively utilizing technology, to see how we could build in that infrastructure that we can now leapfrog into the future. So what I could say in terms of a positive outlook is that our future relies with us. 
what is it that I'm doing within my household to prepare my children to compete in the future, to build up skills around the STEM, the science, the tech, the engineering, the math. What am I doing in terms of between 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. in terms of building skills or reskilling or retraining so that I too can be able to compete, I too could be able to extend services across country or to the, or to the globe. And, uh, as we are and, doing now to the universe. As we're doing now and yeah. more so. So each household sooner or later should be, if you think of it, almost the equivalent of an entrepreneur, of a, of a business. That's why the CEO of your household. So Kevin, um, Karina, I don't know if you have questions, if we have questions from the audience, that was gonna be the next, um, the next thing. We're gonna see if we have any questions. Okay. We have two questions. Um, first question is, is it a good time to start a business considering the economic fallout from COVID-19 or is it best to wait until we are closer to the recovery stage? Kevin, you want to pick that up and I'll comment after. Okay. Every day is a good day to start a business. A lot of times we are forced into business. We are pushed into business because in some instances we, we lost a job. And then is when we start recognizing the talents that we, you know, that, that's been dormant, that are, we have that are dormant. So any opportunity to, to make, to earn income, and to even do proper research, I would strongly support it. Um, a close colleague of mine from, from you, we always said that nothing from nothing leaves nothing. So if I make, if I make the effort, the chances of, of you gaining on the upside is, much, is, is a lot greater. So I pick up there um, when I did the first talk I did for UW, I talked about um, Ready, Set, Reinvent. We have to always reinvent ourselves. But then I, I threw it out to the audience and I said, what's in your hands? So it's, it's what's in your hands. It's what, what are you, what, what job, what, what, what area are you gonna be an entrepreneur in? And as Kevin said, during this downtime, what I took my own advice, what's in my hand, and I created a website and I dumped everything that God had put in my hands on my website. So it's always a good time and nobody knows when we're gonna come out of this pandemic. We are going up and then there's something else that happens. So. I would say, like Kevin said, start now. Next question, please, Karina. Okay, thanks for that um, comment. We have another question from Faye Cook, but I just want to remind the audience that you can type your questions in the chat, raise your hand if you need to speak um, by your mic to be acknowledged. All right, so Faye is asking, can you recommend an ideal retirement plan for self-employed persons? Um, you know, we don't get into recommending globally without seeing your picture because you have to and you have to look at your goals first. Self-employed persons, uh, retired persons, self-employed. For example, one of my um, plans was probably if I didn't have enough money to live in the U.S., I'd go back to St. Vincent. That, that was that was pre-volcano. So, um, you know, you have to look at your goals, look at what, when you want to retire, how many years left for retirement, what you have in your hand today, what have you saved for retirement, and what your lifestyle is going to be. Are you going to go to a lesser cost area of the country or lesser cost country? Are you going to travel? Are you going to, you know, give money to your relatives or your grandkids or, or whatever. So it's a, it's a personal plan. It's not, not something generic. If I may comment on that. So if you're self-employed, it's important to ask yourself this question also. Um, what are your other sources of income? Right? So for example, I'm, I'm employed by an agency, so I'm trading time for money. So if I was to open a business or let's say an online business, that's also business income coming in. Am I also trying to earn additional income by investing, let's say in stocks and bonds? Um, so I think if you're self-employed, it's an opportune time to think as to how you're gonna make your money work for you. You definitely need to sit down, seek advice, design a financial plan with goals and you work towards those goals. Are you thinking of getting, probably doing some investments so you can get some rental income? Or are you making your money work for you? 
Okay, thank you so much. So I have um, a comment here from Errol who said he's online from the UK and I know it's very late in the UK. So thank you so much, Errol, for joining. Um, he you know, said that it's an interesting conversation and thanks to Stacey and Kevin. All right, so I have another question here. The question is, how do you recover from poor money management, from poor financial wellness or literacy? How do you recover from debt after it has gone bad already? What do you do? What are basic steps that you can take? Okay, so I take that and I'd like to thank Errol. I know it's about 3 a.m. in the morning in England or whatever. And Errol is my first cousin. So thanks for the family support. Karina, as you know, I usually take my posse with me. So I... Even online, I take my party with me. <laughs> um, how do you recover? The first thing I'd say to recovery is you have to understand your current situation. Where are you now? In, in addition, I'd start with where I usually start, your income and your expense. As, as Kevin said, is your expense more than your income? You got to look at what's your daily lifestyle, whatever. And when, when you look at that, if your expenses are more than your income, let's get that in line first. Let's cut out some expenses or let's increase the income. Once that's done, do you have any savings? Have you saved your, your emergency? Let's go back, start with three months, move up, move up to six months. After you've done that, and at the same time, look at your credit risk, your debt level. How much debt do you have? So you have to go in stages, but I'd say income, expense, and cash flow first. Savings, and at the same time, savings, we get very little interest on our savings, but we pay a heavy, lots of interest on our credit. So savings and credit balances, let's look at that and let's get, let's fix that. And after you fix that stuff, then you can start, as Kevin said, then you can start looking at, at investment. But I usually tell people you can't invest until you have that emergency fund and savings uh, covered. You have to do those and then so th there are stages and and i'd show you when we before we end i'd show you how i can help you with your stages any other questions karina kevin you want to comment um no i'm comfortable i endorse everything you said Stacey. okay thank you yeah. yes we have a question from natalie ford she's saying bitcoin is gaining prominence what is your advice on bitcoin take that kevin run <laughs> um all jokes aside um i've i'm i'm a beneficiary of bitcoin i had a fraction of a bitcoin coincidentally i um, was doing some work and i bought some coin from a colleague trying to walk out some exchanges bitcoin is dependent on your risk appetite colleagues if again, you're at the stage where you're now trying to be get into investing and building up your nest egg for education, for your children, and you're thinking about retirement, Bitcoin potentially may not be your road to retirement because of the fluctuations in the value. And I mean, wh while one could speculate and say, well, you know, this has been increasing while it's fluctuating, there aren't any certainty. Um, so Bitcoin, should only be, if you're considering investing in Bitcoin, um, Natalie, should only be something if you, you have, you're, you know, you're, you're pretty open in terms of your risk appetite and you have speculative income and you're prepared to gain on the upside or prepared to lose what you're investing. But I would say be cautious with any vehicle that is offering high return because high return equal high risk. And Again, is this something that you can manage in terms of emotionally and otherwise? Is this something that both you and your household could sustain? Okay, thank you so much, Kevin. I hope that answered your question, Natalie. Um, there is um, another question here from Janelle. Um, she said, if, if my debt service ratio is high, no room to save with a large that consolidation secured loan be better be the better option how can one best proceed so i tell you what i did with somebody recently and it depends on, on where, where you live Janelle. um in the u.s 
I, I worked with this lady, uh, she, her, she, her situation was really horrible that, that she allowed herself to spiral there. But um, things happen, life happens and this can happen to anybody. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I encouraged her to work with a debt servicer. So she would pay a certain amount of money to the debt servicer per month. And that person would pay, they would actually first negotiate down her debt. So this is, this, this is a service that's in the US. I'm not sure where, where um, Janelle is coming from and if that service exists. But I would say if you have an opportunity to consolidate and pay lower, but then be mindful and then be a good CEO of your household that what you are saving in the debt pay down, that you take that money and put it in the bank if you could or as much of it as you could to save. Because that is something that you, it's the quicker you dig out of it, the better it is for you because interest can literally kill you. Comments, Kevin, from a Caribbean perspective? Um, definitely. I think um, you've got to be mindful of the interest rates, um, the, the duration for the consolidation, and you've got to sit still and calculate what is the cash flow savings. And what do you intend to do with that cash flow savings? Are you? Is it that you consolidate and from the cash flow savings, you go back into a habit of spending? Or are you gonna set that aside and save and invest? And as a consequence, no even be able to earn something on your investment. And be wise after because um, you should not have to learn that same lesson twice. Okay, anything else, Karina? Thank you so much. I'm not seeing any other questions. I guess that wraps up our great session tonight. So Karina, ho hold on. I just want to show, I would just want to announce my online course. So based on the last session and a lot of sessions I've been doing, I have a course online, CEO of your household. And this is what Jada did, my international intern. Um, I'm so thankful. Kevin, I didn't have to go to Fiverr to get this. I'm training Jada. So Jada is going to do all this stuff. So for right now, we have a coupon. So go online. I have the information on there. And Karina is going to be sending out this from me also. So thank you, Karina, for having us on your stage again. Kevin and I have had a really great time. And we just hope that the audience has, that you have learned a lot. And that when we, when next we get invited, hope you get invited again, we would, we would um, come back and do another session for you, Karina. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Stacey, and thank you, Kevin, for taking the time out to present to our audience. I found it very informative. As you said, it would, be, would have been impactful, informational, and interesting, and that it was. So thank you both again for taking the time out, and we will definitely be working with you in the future. Thank you so much, participants, for joining and for participating, and we look forward to sharing more webinars with you in the future. So good night, everyone, and stay safe. Okay. Likewise, stay safe, colleagues. Okay. Bye, everybody. Take care, stay safe. Thanks for the platform. Yes, you're welcome. Bye then. Ciao. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm logging off right now. I see Errol is still on.